Thank you, praise team. Great job, as usual. Our scripture, as you see in the bulletin, is uh, has a page is Psalms thirty eight, and then John fourteen six. And I bet you we can all quote John fourteen six. Seven, 14, 6. Uh, Psalm 37. Commit your way to the Lord. Trust in him and he will do this. He will make your righteous reward shine like the dawn, your vindication like the noonday sun. Be still before the Lord and wait patiently for him. Do not fret when people succeed in their ways, when they carry out their wicked schemes. And from Psalm, uh, from John 14, 7, I'll bet you we can all say that. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. When I was asked to do uh, a sermon on the Camino, on our, uh, Debbie's and my experience on the Camino, I went back and forth saying, wow, I'd really like to do a travel log because it was such an amazing and enormous experience that how can I put it into a sermon format that actually comes from the Word of God and inspires people to action and that sort of thing. So I first wrote it as a sermon, then I wrote it as a travel log, and then last night I said, no, that's not right, and I wrote it again as a sermon. But uh, what I'm going to try to do to you, do to you, do with you today, uh, is walk you through some of the experiences that we had on our pilgrimage to, on, to Santiago. Well, we didn't make it to Santiago, as you know, uh, but there, uh, I will have some helps, and around here you'll see in the narthex there are some pictures. If you want to try picking up the backpack that we carried, Debbie brought hers, 17 pounds. Try putting that on, walk 17 miles. So we have some artifacts from our trip around, but mostly I want you to kind of sit back and, and feel what we felt while we were there. One thing I want to point out that I did not put in the sermon is uh, this passport, this is Debbie's, mine's out on the Narthex table. Everywhere we stayed, we could only stay if we had this passport. And we got the little stamps from every, uh, the hostel, the pilgrim's hospital, hospital, hostels. They used to be called hospitals in the medieval times. But um, th this is a precious, precious memory and it's interesting because the, the lodging was restricted to people who were on the Camino. I want first to, you can follow along because I know it's too small, but I'm going to pray this prayer of the pilgrim that ma many of the cathedrals we went in, they had pilgrim's blessings at night and they would have it, uh, sometimes they would have it in several languages. I was always impressed when we heard that, usually it was in Spanish, and we just knew that what they were saying, uh, but of course didn't know the Spanish. But here it is, Lord, the, pilgrim, the prayer of the pilgrims. Lord, you who recalled your servant Abraham out of the town of Ur in Chaldea and who watched over him during all his wanderings, you who guided the Jewish people through the desert, we also query to watch your present servants, who for love of your name make a pilgrimage to Santiago de Compostela. Be for us a companion on our journey, a guide on our interactions, intersections, the strengthening during fatigue, the fortress in danger, the resource on our itinerary, the shadow in our heat, the light in our darkness, the consolation during dejection, and the power of our intention. So that we, under your guidance, safely and unhurt, may reach the end of our journey and strengthen with gratitude and power, secure and filled with happiness, may join our home. 
for Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Well, we could talk about, Debbie and I could talk about this Camino for hours, and we have already. We still do. But I want to focus on some things that we learned on the pilgrimage and the perspective on the pilgrim's life that was modeled in the life of Jesus. And I do want to thank you first for, um, I want to, I will comment on these slides. This is actually part of the Camino. This was a birch forest, and that little path there, is where we walked. We took all these pictures are taken mostly by Debbie. That's why I'm in them mostly. <laughs> Sorry, because <laughs> she had a better camera than I did. First, let me thank you for your support and prayers. I saw some green bracelets today. Even I can tell you, we were they were those prayers were very needed and very felt as we navigated on this Camino. We call it Chapter One, which is the first the first say 300 or so miles, and then chapter two, which was two weeks of, uh, of illness. I'm not going to talk about chapter two today. We'll only talk about chapter one. Although I may speak in my voice, I know that Debbie will mirror my sentiments too, so you're going to ask her if you want after this about certain things. Walking the Camino was spiritually invigorating, and it was indeed physically challenging for both of us. Well, the Camino, um, talking about, well, there's, here's some of the physical challenges. This is up in the mountains where we're crossing the Pyrenees Mountains. It was very steep, and we took the easy way. The hard way was up the mountain and down the mountain. And there's some other, challenge, some other challenges that we had, but with gorgeous scenery. Jesus' example is a perfect way, though, to honor Father's Day, in case you thought I was going to forget about it being Father's Day. He was perfectly obedient, perfectly loving, and finished the work, <laughs> the chores, finished the work that his father had sent him to do. Jesus communicated regularly with his father, and he loved the father above his own life. Jesus was a perfect son. So it is appropriate to talk about Jesus, of course, on Father's Day. Well, how this started was, in 2016, I met my first pilgrim from the Camino de Santiago de Compostela. And that's translated, the way of St. James of the Field of Stars. I'll talk a little bit about the Field of Stars in a little bit. Dennis was my, this pilgrim, and he was a gentle French-Canadian soul who was mellowed from a lifetime of hiking and meditation. He had come to Taze Monastery, where Debbie and I were, after his finishing his third Camino to explore some rest and some conversation. He had just heard about Taze. We had just heard about the Camino. His lesson to me was, the Camino provides. That sparked a curiosity to explore exactly what that meant from him, both as an actual hike across a country and life as a pilgrimage. And there it is. The hike from southern France across Spain to the cathedral, way over on your left, would become a passionate pursuit of mine for the next three years as I threw myself into reading about the Camino and other pilgrimages, too. I interviewed other pilgrims, not just Christian pilgrims, but Muslim pilgrims to Mecca and Hindu pilgrims to India and uh, Buddhist pilgrims to Thailand. And I started physical training, of course. Now, as a practical matter, you might ask yourself, why would anyone want to walk 540 miles? I found myself drawn, like millions before me, to this extraordinary adventure. I was asked, is this a spiritual thing? Is it a mission trip? Are you trying to prove something because of your age? I got that a lot. <laughs> is this a vacation? Why not just go to Spain, get a nice resort, and go sightsee? Well, let me give you a little history about the Camino that might answer some of those questions. This is St. James. This is a depiction of how he's depicted. 
James the Apostle is the brother of John. Remember James and John, the son of Je Zebedee, the sons of thunder, as Jesus called them. We know that after the death and resurrection of Jesus, that he sailed to what we know as Western Spain and preached the gospel there in a small village called Padron. Uh, now, interestingly, he's usually depicted uh, on a horse, and he's fighting the Moors, which actually didn't happen until the 700s. But that has to do with a, a, some myth and legend, and we'll go into that another time. He'd been there in southern Spain, or in uh, western Spain, for a few years when he returned to Jerusalem to become leader of the new church. In AD 42, just nine years after Pentecost, Herod had him beheaded. His apostles, St. James, he became a saint later. He was uh, uh, made a saint by the Catholic Church. He was, did you realize, the first apostle to die and the first apostle to be martyred. We remember Stephen, but he was not an apostle. He was a deacon. Well, so his disciples brought his body back to this little village in Spain, Padron, and they buried him where he would be forgotten. In the 800s then, a shepherd as the, as the story goes, was out with his sheep in a meadow, and he saw bright lights hovering over this meadow. Now, we would probably call that a UFO sighting these days, but he reported this to the bishop, and the bishop declared that the remains of St. James have been found. Eventually, a cathedral was built over the site, and it became a pilgrimage site. Now, in the Roman Catholic tradition, a pilgrimage is used to to demonstrate your, uh, as a penance, to demonstrate your devotion to Christ, to show how, that you, to learn how to, to uh, treat others like Christ, to um, more, more strongly lead a holy life, to learn how to do that. And I tell you, the simplicity will lead you to a holy life, that's for sure. And it was, a, these pilgrimages were part of the healing of a repentant sinner. The three pilgrimages were one to Compostela, to Santiago de Compostela, to Jerusalem, and to Rome. So this has been around. The first pilgrimage to Santiago is recorded in 950. So it's been a very uh, uh, active pilgrimage site for a long time. Well, as I studied pilgrimage for myself, I sensed this pull of the other pilgrims some kind of an inexplicable desire to see what that journey was about. Seemingly motivated by something sacred outside of me, Jesus had said, I am the way, I am the Camino. The psalmist said, commit your way to the Lord. The common theme in my reading was that the true Camino, the true way, was both an inward and an outward journey. I began to see this whole project as a bigger part of my life, another hurdle, a new frontier, a challenge, a different and new way to experience Jesus as the way. In fact, experience Jesus as the way that provides. So the pilgrimage began to take shape in my mind as my body became a little bit more conditioned to long hiking. I began to speculate not only about my journey, but of those other pilgrims who were guided and driven by the same urge that I was. Why did they go? What were they seeking? What did they find? I want to talk for a second about this sculpture. It's on. It's a, called the Alto de Perdon. It's out right outside of Pamplona. And if we were looking the other direction, we'd see Pamplona. And that's where they run the bulls. That was fun to go through there. There were no bulls when we were there. Uh, and this was this sculpture was placed on the top of this very tall uh, hill, short mountain. <laughs> we had just walked up. And it depicts pilgrims. There are 12 pilgrims. The first one on the far left is what maybe the earliest pilgrims, uh, religious pilgrims, would look like. And you see here on the right, there are a couple of backpackers. This is a famous uh, spot that signifies that pilgrimage has been part of uh, almost an 
archetypal activity across centuries, across every tradition. And we are very happy to make it up this high. We are almost out of the mountains by this time. We learned uh, the, out the outward preparation was more obvious. This was an inward preparation. Uh, the inward journey started as soon as the commitment was made. In prayer, I was given this phrase, there is abundance. You may recognize this because we also use this later as a theme for last summer's uh, There is Abundance campaign. This little piece of paper was, uh, I wrote on this card, the Lord gave it to me in prayer. I kept it in my backpack ever since. And you can see it's kind of in bad shape. But that was what the Lord wanted to teach me. There is abundance. Now the outward preparation is more obvious. Gear, conditioning, trip planning, buying tickets, getting time off work. But when it came right down to it, we didn't know what it would be like to get up every morning in a different pilgrim's hosp hostel, grab our things, throw them in the backpack, walk without a clue as to how far we would go, what we would encounter that day, hand wash our clothes every evening, and be stripped of almost everything that was familiar and convenient. Uh, I want to say this telephone over there, for those of you who don't read Spanish or just can't see it, it says, we don't have Wi-Fi, talk to each other. <laughs> I find that very amusing. The guy in the middle is Eduardo, who treated us like Jesus. And we, when we left, we said, that man reminds us of Jesus. He had lived for 16 or 19 years. I can't remember. He had always lived in this... Uh, uh, hostile, and he served with joy. You could just see the joy on his face. He remembered everybody's name. He was a wonderful guy. This lady over here on the on the lower left uh, rescued us because I forgot my hiking poles, and she found them and brought them out to the street and was saying, Americanos. <laughs> And then, you may not be able to see it, but it says welcome in Spanish, bienvenido up there. Uh, the welcome was, a, the culture of welcome was apparent everywhere we went. Simplicity was a part of our lesson. Quite into the other one, I, the next slide. Uh, this is how, where we stayed most of the time in these kind of bunk beds in a group, a dormitory, sometimes a big dormitory, a little, and yes, that is hand washing, and that is the color of the water <laughs> after a day's hike. I was almost embarrassed to put that up there, but it was kind of fun. And then our meals were very, very simple, and we shared everything. The simple culture of the Camino was apparent, too, in the kind and hospitable people who lived in the villages, like Eduardo, and the open-heartedness of the pilgrims to one another's needs. We shared food. Band-Aids, well, their, their form of Band-Aids is called Compede. See those blisters? We shared blister care. Everybody took care of everybody else. That was the biggest uh, threat to the in the Camino. Uh, we shared food, Band-Aids, and Compede. That's that special stuff in the middle. Water with each other, warm clothes, because it was very cold in the mountains, and encouragement on a daily basis. We were Jesus to each other. Since it was a practice on the, the Camino to view each person as a pilgrim and not by their employment, it actually took barriers down and freed people to be who they were, not who their jobs are, uh, which, which I found very freeing myself. This shell, in the next slide, is the most famous symbol of the Camino and is used all along the Camino as a way marker. The destination over on your left is God the Father. And Jesus is the way, the process, the model on how we come to God. Jesus is the way. I understood that to mean life as a pilgrimage, a journey whose purpose unfolds as it's undertaken. Now, you might find it interesting that we did not use a map to hike 300 miles. One purpose of the pilgrimage was to learn to look for the way. The way was marked in various ways. Now this was a fun thing <laughs> along the entire route. 
This is a sample of way markers. Sometimes we would stop, Debbie and I would stop and say, you, because you want to make sure you stayed on the path. Um, there were way markers everywhere, and they were either these formal ones or these yellow arrows. We found them everywhere. On the far left lower one, do you see the way marker? Okay, it's a tiny little arrow on the edge of that wall, but it's, that's reassuring <laughs> if you don't know where you're going. Next, next slide, please. Uh, we sometimes find the boots. We set all kinds of ways uh, with uh, shells and way markers, and there's one more. Even this tower had an arrow on it. Uh, there's Debbie in front of a, we had to just go off a road and go down through a path that had, I don't know why we had to use the gate because there wasn't really a fence, but we went through the gate because it says go through the gate, uh, so we did. And then over here uh, on the lower right, it's just on a rock. So <clears throat> that's, how we f that's how we hiked 300 miles with these little arrows. Uh, following the way. I'll tell you, that takes a little bit of little faith. It reminds us that, that uh, sometimes we would just stop and look around for a marker, just like we do in the Christian life. It always appeared, though, in some fashion to reassure us that we were still on the Camino. We were still on the way. It reminded us also that Jesus is always there, guiding us through the Holy Spirit, sometimes in a very obvious way, and sometimes requiring a faithful search. Don't you wish that our lives had these yellow arrows so obvious to mark our way? Well, every morning I would pray for Jesus to make him known, make himself known in the people that I met and in the circumstances and in the day's travel. Time after time, we were provided with exactly the resources we need, a spectacular view to remind us of God's power. I have another slide here. Uh, and that was at the top of a hill, so we were really glad to see that <laughs> winding down. A spectacular view. That is, by the way, wheat fields on either side, and that yellow back there is a canola field, which was in bloom because it was spring. We saw beautiful flowers blooming everywhere. A spectacular view to remind us of God's power in the creation, a water fountain when we needed it, a place to rest, a place to get food, or a place to get a bed for the night. That is what was meant by the Camino provides. We knew it was our loving God who was caring for us all the time in his loving, loving sovereignty. We also experienced Jesus as the truth. This is the cross of St. James, which we saw also marking the way. We spent a lot of time in beautiful cathedrals all along the way, praying. We prayed our way all across Spain. Many of them had ancient artifacts from the ages of the Crusades. Acro behind this, these are just two of the many, many, many cathedrals. And I will say that sometimes they were dark and they required you to put a euro in the box and it would light up. I guess it saved him a little energy. But behind this grid, if you can see, is a silver cross that was used in the Crusades. It was at this church that we lit a, uh, a candle for Johnny and prayed for him there because they had a, a place to do that. We were told only, only, only the old women went to church now anymore. Many of the churches in the village were locked. But the truth there, though, we saw the truth of the gospel so ornately and beautifully portrayed, particularly as they were preparing for Easter, and that was really meaningful for us. You've probably now, by now all heard the term postmodern to describe the last two generations in Europe and in the U.S. as having no common Christian experience and no place for God in their lives. They don't attend these churches. It's not that they don't believe there's a God out there somewhere, but it just has nothing to do with them. And our Wednesday class last week, our Wednesday night class last week, we talked about Christianity now being a subculture of the main culture in the U.S. A very well-developed and a very active one, but still 
a subculture, not the main stream of society. This wave came from Europe, and we observe it now here daily. A common question around the tables at the end of the day when all the pilgrims would gather in the restaurants was, why are you doing the Camino? Time after time, the response was something like this. I just quit my job. I just got fired. I just got a divorce. Well, I just finished school, and I'm looking for something. One bright young, young woman from California named Angel told me that from the outside, she had an enviable life. She had a house on the beach in California. She worked from home on her computer. She had no particular responsibility. She had a great income. She said, my life on the outside looks great, but I am miserable. Angel and I engaged in an extended conversation over the clothes dryer one afternoon. She walked with us for a couple of days and perhaps went on a step closer to Jesus. During a holy week, we made a special effort to worship every day. We came across two prayer labyrinths one outlined in rocks. There's one that was just in a town. And I'm walking through it. I don't know if that. No, that's Debbie walking through it. A rare picture of Debbie. One outlined in rocks, a giant cross with I love you written out in rocks. And a, we created, uh, next slide, please. There's the labyrinth in rocks. And then we created this worship space. This looks like fire, but actually it's a poncho. <laughs> We created a worship space and worship for about an hour beside a river one day on Holy Week. Debbie and I always prayed before our meals, always. This became a curiosity and a conversation starter as people would ask us, are you praying? Do you always do that? And then they would bring up and we would say, well, yeah, of course, yeah, we do. We thank God for our our safety for our food for the day. Then they would tend to bring up some struggle, interestingly, in life that they were having. The emptiness in seeing the truth as only what is true for me was glaring in that culture. I came to realize that I had taken for granted some of the spiritual truths I'd held for a long time, one that give, gives my life richness and meaning. You'll often hear me pray at the table in other places, a uh, prayer of thanks that life has meaning and is worth living. But the emptiness I heard on the Camino told me that this is a, not a common experience now. The pilgrims were looking for something, and that's why they undertook the pilgrimage. They didn't know they were looking for God, but they were. When I saw there were people who had no anchor, no sense of God, of a God who loved them, they were drifting through life and feeling that life was getting away from them with no place to put their hope. I just pray that some of our conversation were those pebbles that would make waves later on down the road. We also experienced Jesus as the life, the way the truth of Jesus, and the life. A couple chapters from our reading today in John 14, which I didn't bother to, to open because we all know that verse, Jesus is still meeting with his disciples. We call this the final discourse where he sits with his disciples and he tells them the things that are very important before he's about to die. And in John, John 17, we see this prayer of Jesus. It seems like he abruptly erupts into prayer to his father. And he says in this prayer, we could, and this is eternal life that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. I glorified on you, on you on earth, having finished the work you gave me. He said, I finished the work you gave me. Remember, this is before the arrest, the crucifixion, the death of Jesus. 
He had already finished the work. Well, what was that work? It was to make known the Father, to make known the heart of God. It was in the relationships that he modeled with everyone that he encountered that showed the disciples and shows us who God is, what God is like, and how much he wants to bring the kingdom of God to the world in the same kind of relationship. That was the task entrusted to the disciples. That was the work that Jesus was sent to do. And that is the same task entrusted to us today. Jesus showed us what the kingdom of God looks like. He showed us what the abundant life looks like. And it looks like this. Jesus accepted all persons as they were, where they were, and loved them there first. He worked with the poor and the sick and the vulnerable, not with financial resources, but by coming alongside them with attention to their hearts and what they love. He always asked, what are you seeking? And he revealed himself through their needs, often knowing that what we seek is what we eventually find. When we notice the kingdom of God around us, we experience Jesus as the life, the one who shows us where the kingdom of God is near. The way, oh, I'll have to talk about this. This is early in our trip. See those two little orange dots? That's Debbie and me. We were known for our orange <laughs> ponchos. And somebody looked us up and said, oh, you're the Americans with the orange. They gave us this. The way, the truth, and the life. God was, Jesus was not trying to give us some litmus test about what we say, but was continually demonstrating the kingdom of God. That was his work on earth. And that's ours too. Walk in faith, knowing that God loves you, knows what you need, and will provide. Jesus is the Camino. Jesus will provide. And this, of course, in Spanish is, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Signed, Jesus. Walk in the life, walk in the truth that God is sovereign and always working in the world, in your world. Walk in the truth, walk in faith, knowing that God loves you. God knows what you need and will provide. Walk in the life that sees and responds to the image of God in every person. To live in the kingdom of God and in the kingdom of God's blessing right now. Amen.